Hello, and thank you. I'm James Powelski, and I'm Professor of Practice and Director of Education in the Positive Psychology Center at the University of Pennsylvania. I was pleased to attend the World Humanities Conference in Liège, Belgium in 2017, and I was inspired by conversations with Louis Oosterbeck, John Crowley, Chao Zhejin, Bill McBride, Rosalind Hackett, Marguerite Berrier, Lucille Laspini, and so many others. As a philosopher, I believe deeply in the vision of UNESCO and the International Council for Philosophy and Human Sciences that the humanities should play a greater role in our world. And I'm grateful for their collaboration with the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology in organizing this European Humanities Conference and for giving me this opportunity to speak. The title of my talk is A Brief Introduction to the Positive Humanities. Engagement with art, literature, philosophy, music, history, religion, theater, film, and other forms of culture can greatly enrich our lives. It can help us expand our inner worlds as children, choose rewarding life paths as adolescents, come to terms with difficult life experiences as adults, feel the joy of creativity and collaboration with others, connect more deeply to our civic identities as members of a society, and rekindle hope in the ongoing work of social justice. A careful consideration of these kinds of vital experiences can reveal how engagement with the humanities can help individuals and communities flourish. This is the domain of the new field of the positive humanities. It is important to, artic to articulate clearly what is and is not meant by the positive humanities. Since this term may initially conjure up a range of unrelated associations from positivism to positive thinking. The Oxford English Dictionary defines the humanities broadly as, quote, the branch of learning concerned with human culture, end quote. I would like to define the positive humanities as the branch of learning concerned with human culture in its relation to human flourishing. The positive humanities seek to understand the conceptual nuances of this relationship in a variety of contexts in different societies across time. They also investigate the practical effects of cultural engagement on human flourishing with a particular emphasis on how such engagement can be intentionally optimized to help individuals and communities thrive. Grounded in the wisdom, narrative, aesthetic, and performance traditions of cultures across time and around the world, and thus always inclusive of the arts, they seek insights into the nature and development of human flourishing from this vast storehouse of human experience. The positive, the positive humanities are also informed by more recent efforts in the sciences to bring empirical methodologies to bear in the investigation of well being. And their practical emphasis connects the positive humanities to the educational institutions, creative industries, and cultural organizations through which the humanities are often studied and experienced. It is important to begin with an acknowledgement that human flourishing is a central and perennial concern of the humanities. The historical roots of the humanities stretch back to ancient Greece and Rome and the development of programs of study designed to teach citizens the knowledge and skills needed to flourish. The Greek paideia and the Roman liberal arts emphasize the study of language, philosophy, mathematics, science, and the arts as requisites for free individuals to live life well and participate successfully and wisely in civic life. These domains became codified as the trivium, including grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and the quadrivium, composed of arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy, with these subjects serving as the core of the curriculum in medieval European universities. Growing out of these historical roots, the humanities were first defined as a distinct domain and program of study during the Renaissance. In a very real sense, the humanities are the gift of a pandemic. Much more severe than even the current COVID-19 pandemic, the Black Death was the most deadly pandemic recorded in human history. It killed up to 200 million people as it ravaged Europe, Asia, and North Africa in the 14th century. The Italian scholar and poet Francesco Petrarca, Petrarch, lived during this time and wrote movingly about the devastating effects of the plague on those it struck, on those it spared, and on the societies in which they lived. To cope in these horrific times, Petrarch turned to the study of the Greek and especially the Roman classics for guidance on how to think, write, and live. Petrarch's approach focusing both on what to read and on how to read it 
was taken up and further developed by his followers who came to be called humanists after Cicero's phrase, studia humanitatis. These humanists were dissatisfied with the contemporary scholastic approaches to learning that had been adopted in the universities. They argued that these approaches had come to overemphasize logic and linguistic analysis, focusing on techniques of abstract thinking and resolution of textual contradictions instead of the improvement of students' lives. They advocated a return to the Greek and Roman classics in a way that would renew the ancient project of education for the purpose of living life well promoting a particular approach to classical learning. They turned away from the mathematical and scientific subjects of the liberal arts contained in the quadrivium and focused on redesigning the trivium. Removing logic from the trivium, they supplemented the remaining subjects of grammar and rhetoric with history, philosophy, and poetry. They saw the humanities as a course of study that would lead them toward wisdom, clarify the nature of happiness and its relation to virtue, and provide sound guidance for their lives. Thus, human flourishing is not only a central concern of the humanities, but was a key catalyst for their initial development. In our contemporary world, the humanities tend to be thought of less as a comprehensive program of study and more as a collection of disciplines pursued in our academic institutions. A concern for human flourishing is at the root of each of these disciplines. However, this concern is often superseded by other interests in the academy. Humanities disciplines housed within institutions of higher education are shaped by their values, norms, and systems of recruitment, retention, and reward. In the United States, for example, early institutions of higher learning considered the moral found formation of their students to be one of their chief missions. With the rise of research universities, however, priorities in higher education shifted to the creation of new knowledge. These new priorities have led to significant breakthroughs in research but they have also shifted the focus of faculty away from questions of living life well and toward narrow points of scholarship. The practical aims that initially inspired humanistic study are thus often eclipsed by the theoretical and methodological demands of the kind of disciplinary scholarship currently required for professional success in academia. Contemporary research aims more at the analysis of texts than the practice of wisdom. Helen Small has presented a general definition of the humanities as the study of the quote, meaning-making practices of human cultures past and present, focusing on interpretation and critical evaluation, primarily in terms of the individual response and with an ineliminable element of subjectivity. Studying the meaning-making practices of human cultures does not, of course, entail an ability to make meaning effectively oneself, and the current focus of the humanities is more on the analysis of meaning making than on the creation of meaning. Another common feature of current approaches to the humanities that can limit the work of human flourishing is the form the analysis of meaning making often takes. Such analysis frequently follows the methodology of critical theory using what Paul Ricoeur called a quote, hermeneutics of suspicion, reading texts against the grain to discover hidden meanings, latent psychopathologies, and corrosive ideologies. This is a valuable approach that can yield important insights into various obstacles to human flourishing, but an overemphasis on the theoretical dismantling of texts can suggest not only that the humanities today are not about meaning making and are only about the academic study of meaning making, but also that any meaning making endeavor is not worth undertaking as it is bound to fail. Informed by such scholarship, pedagogy in the humanities is likely to emphasize theory over practice, suspicion over affirmation, and academic credit over eudaimonic outcome. This approach can make it difficult for students to discern how the humanities are connected to their lives in any vital way, even though so many of them are struggling with issues of anxiety and depression related to questions of meaning and identity, just the kinds of matters the humanities were initially developed to address. Thus, the professional interests of scholars and the academic interests of students are often quite different from the eudaimonic concerns at the root of the humanities. Outside of academia, the situation is quite similar, with the humanities put to use in the service of various economic industries, for example, the movie industry, the publishing industry, the music industry, where financial interests often eclipse eudaimonic concerns. At the same time that these obstacles are hindering work on human flourishing in the humanities, there's a surge of interest in human flourishing in other domains. 
The social sciences, for example, are increasingly coming under the influence of what I like to call the eudaimonic turn, the understanding of human flourishing as a core interest and goal of their endeavors. This eudaimonic turn is perhaps nowhere more advanced than in psychology, where it has led to the founding of a new branch of the discipline, positive psychology. Positive psychology is often defined as the scientific study of what makes individuals and communities thrive. This field was catalyzed by Martin Seligman in 1998 when he was president of the American Psychological Association. Seligman and his colleagues argued that psychology had become imbalanced, focusing almost exclusively on pathology and leaving out the study of flourishing individuals and thriving communities. They held that an overemphasis on the study of pathology had left psychologists largely ignorant of things like hope, wisdom, creativity, future-mindedness, courage, and perseverance, all of which help make life worth living. They contended that an understanding and cultivation of optimal human functioning can help both increase well-being and decrease pathology, since one of the most effective ways of buffering against mental illness is cultivating human strengths. Positive psychology has grown tremendously since 1998. Positive psychologists have been awarded hundreds of millions of dollars for their research, have founded academic journals to publish the results of their investigations, have established national, regional, and global organizations, and are centrally involved in widespread efforts to support well being across our society. Positive psychology has influenced work in domains such as economics, neuroscience, political science, sociology, and organizational development. Sectors such as medicine, business, education, law, and law enforcement are applying research from positive psychology to help professionals experience greater well being while also being more effective in their work. At the global level, the United Nations has, since 2012, published an annual World Humanities Report detailing levels of happiness in nations around the world. And in 2018, the Global Happiness Council began publishing a complementary report describing steps countries can take to increase their levels, levels of happiness and well-being. Dozens of nations use well-being measures to supplement economic indicators as benchmarks of growth, and more and more countries are explicitly adopting increased well-being as a governmental goal. Although the eudaimonic turn is more advanced in the social sciences, its effects are beginning to be seen in the humanities as well. The new field of the positive humanities explicitly adopts the eudaimonic turn, emphasizing the centrality of human flourishing as a theme of study and as a practical goal of culture. Given the fact that human flourishing is at the root of the humanities, however, there is a real sense in which this is a eudaimonic return, not to some imagined golden age, but to the questions and concerns that gave rise to the humanities in the first place and that have been at their core for most of their history. In the contemporary context, this return must be informed by new knowledge, new perspectives, and new cultural realities that can help generate new approaches fitting for our times to these perennial concerns. What are some of the hallmarks of the new approaches needed to understand and optimize the relationship between culture and human flourishing? First, it is important to keep in mind the specific theoretical and practical outcomes of the positive humanities. On the theoretical level, they seek to understand the relationship between culture and human flourishing as it has developed across time in cultures around the world and as it currently exists across the broadest possible range of contexts. Building on this knowledge, the positive humanities look for practical ways in which it can be optimized in the future. How might the understanding of human flourishing be deepened? How might flourishing be more inclusive, extending not just to certain privileged persons or communities, but to all individuals and groups within society? How might culture be developed and engaged with in such a way that it most strongly supports both the immediate and the long-term flourishing of society as a whole? In carrying out their theoretical and practical aims, the positive humanities understand that the relationship between culture and human flourishing is complex. Culture often strongly supports human flourishing, but it can also at times undermine it. As mentioned earlier, the hermeneutics of suspicion can support human flourishing by identifying ways in which culture sometimes obstructs well being. But this critical function of the humanities must be balanced by reparative and constructive work, by what Ricoeur called in a less remarked phrase a, quote, hermeneutics of affirmation. 
the mitigative work of identifying and removing obstacles to well being must be complemented by the promotional work of conceptualizing and cultivating human flourishing. Second, the positive humanities emphasize the intrinsic benefits of culture. They note, of course, the numerous instrumental uses of culture, including its appropriation for professional, academic, vocational, and economic ends. But they focus more on the intrinsic, eudaimonic benefits of engagement with the humanities. For example, personal enjoyment, individual and societal growth, meaning making, and social bonding. Studying the effects they have on human flourishing and how these effects can be optimized. Third, the positive humanities recognize the importance of repairing the rupture caused when Renaissance humanist, humanists turned away from the sciences. Whether or not the quadrivium could have provided useful perspectives on human flourishing, contemporary social sciences certainly can. Much work has been done in positive psychology and the science of well being in general that can both bring clarity to the intrinsic benefits of cultural engagement and make possible their empirical assessment. It is important to note, of course, that assessing the role of culture in human flourishing is not the same as assessing culture itself. The positive humanities do not seek to measure the humanities, whatever that might actually mean, nor do they seek to measure the value of the humanities. It may well be that the most important value of the humanities cannot be measured. Yet engagement in the humanities often produces well-being effects, and at least some of these effects are measurable. Scientific studies have shown, for example, that arts education can increase social and emotional well being in children. Arts interventions can provide a sense of community and belonging among adults. And regular group singing can enhance the quality of life and reduce the loneliness, anxiety, and depression of the elderly. It would be a misuse of these findings to try to create a hierarchy of cultural worth based on them. But studies like these can be helpful for understanding how engagement in the humanities can support or undermine well being in different contexts and how the effects of these experiences on human flourishing can be optimized. Much more work needs to be done in this area, but it is heartening to see increasing numbers of reports being published in this domain by universities, foundations, governments, and the United Nations. A further benefit of collaboration with the science of well being is that it could allow humanities scholars to make deeper and more informed contributions to contemporary policy debates. As the eudaimonic turn takes greater hold in areas as diverse as education, healthcare, and government, thought leaders are turning to scientists for strategic advice. Collaborative efforts could allow important perspectives, insights, and practices from the humanities to inform this work as well, with the possibility of more robust and culturally sensitive outcomes. To be effective, collaborations between the humanities and the sciences must be robust, going beyond merely cursory reading and polite quotation. Scientists can help inform and guide work in the humanities on human flourishing, and humanities scholars can make significant contributions to the science of well being, providing powerful theoretical foundations on which to ground empirical work, aiding in the creation of more robust and nuanced constructs, and suggesting approaches, activities, rituals, practices, and traditions that can open up whole new domains of well-being interventions. These collaborations must also extend beyond academia to include creative industries, such as the music, movie, and publishing industries, nonprofit organizations, music and art schools and groups, museums, libraries, performing arts centers, and the like, the public humanities, and the experience of the general public. These collaborations are of vital importance since no single approach to these questions is sufficient to yield a sufficiently deep understanding of human flourishing and enable its effective and equitable cultivation. These collaborations can support the application of the positive humanities in a variety of domains, including classrooms that go beyond merely providing information about flourishing and include practical processes for its actual cultivation. In the various arts and humanities industries and sectors, and in the everyday appreciation of cultural experiences, they can foreground the importance of human flourishing, resulting in the creation and curation of movies, music, art, novels, poetry, and other cultural artifacts that intentionally explore different aspects of human flourishing, and in the engagement with these artifacts in ways that support the actual increase of the well being of individuals and communities. In conclusion, 
The positive humanities, as we have seen, are an emerging new field of inquiry and practice concerned with culture in its relation to human, fl human flourishing. This field offers new approaches to some very old questions about living life well. The goal of these new approaches is to address these questions in fruitful ways, fitting for our times, and thus to make significant contributions to human flourishing. An important source of support for this emerging field is the Humanities and Human Flourishing Project, which I direct at the University of Pennsylvania. Since receiving our first grant in 2014, the Humanities and Human Flourishing Project has developed into a growing international and multidisciplinary network of well over 150 humanities scholars, scientific researchers, college and university educators, arts practitioners, wellness officers, policy ex experts, members of government, and leaders of cultural organizations. We are deeply grateful for support from the University of Pennsylvania, the Templeton Religion Trust, and the United States National Endowment for the Arts, which has allowed us to publish a number of conceptual papers and systematic reviews, develop a toolkit of measures, bring together researchers and groups of scholars in eight different humanities disciplines, and establish a book series on the humanities and human flourishing with Oxford University Press. My presentation today is based on a chapter in the Oxford Handbook of the Positive Humanities, due out in December 2021. The full chapter is titled The Positive Humanities, Culture and Human Flourishing, and a preprint is currently available at www.humanitiesandhumanflourishing.org. More information on the Humanities and Human Flourishing Project, including our work as a National Endowment for the Arts Research Lab and other current efforts can also be found on that website at www.humanitiesandhumanflourishing.org. Much more work is needed in all of these areas, of course. If these efforts are successful, the positive humanities may help bring much needed change to cultural norms about what it means to live well, both individually and collectively. By providing a deeper and more extensive understanding of human flourishing, and by enabling more nuanced and accurate methods for assessing its presence, they may make it possible to cultivate human flourishing more effectively. The positive humanities may help us move beyond the well being effects engagement in the humanities currently have to the effects they can have when informed and shaped by the eudaimonic turn. A sustained and collaborative emphasis on human flourishing in the work of humanities scholars, creative practitioners, empirical researchers classroom teachers, and other professionals across academic disciplines, creative industries, and cultural sectors carries the fair promise of contributing significantly to well-being in our society. Given the central role the humanities can play in helping people connect deeply with each other, this work may be effective in combating the sharp increase in loneliness, anxiety, and depression plaguing many areas of the world. Given the way the humanities can help bring individuals and groups together in a society, this work may support efforts to create greater social justice and reweave the social fabric, making it easier to work effectively across ethnic and national divides to address such urgent issues as pandemics, poverty, violence, and climate change. In addition to mitigating these individual and social ills, the positive humanities may promote thriving by opening up new levels of optimal human functioning. In these and other ways, the positive humanities may lead to the acquisition and application of new knowledge that clarifies and strengthens the relationship between culture and human flourishing. The practical aim of this work is not the discovery of the royal road to the good life, but rather the clearing of promising pathways toward greater flourishing for individuals, communities, and societies around the world. Thank you.